Okay, so um, what am I going to cover? Um, I am going to cover the basics about co-housing, just so we can make sure that we're talking about the same thing. Co-housing has become hugely popular, but within that, uh, there's a lot of uh, confusion about what co-housing might be. Um, a couple of case studies, uh, although we might only get to do one, and we'll just look at the, um, the development route of, of, of co-housing as well. Um, I have, for those that we talk, we are, I am focusing on co-housing, and I know there's other presentations in the week about other uh, community housing models. Um, I recently co-authored a report called The Scale and Viability of Community Housing, and that covers the spectrum of different models, and that's free to download um, from Locality's website. And that, I think that will hopefully give you confidence, A, there's a lot going on out there that's already delivered, and B, that it's actually quite a viable proposition, and that's really what we majored on, looking at existing projects. Um, and, and how, how they finance what they do from um, self-help, self-build, community land trust and so forth. Um, yes, so this, this is a, a long list of co-housing videos. There's some really, really good introduction videos. I love the one at the top, um, Co-Housing by Kids. Um, it's a Canadian video, but it explains the concept so well. And if you ever you're part of a group or wanting to talk about this with a group of people, um, it's great. But there's a, there's a number of other ones there as well. So what's co-housing about? It's not actually about housing, really. Housing is the byproduct of, uh, of co-housing. It's about living collaboratively um, in community, and that's the most important thing. It's about living sustainably for some communities. That's quite a high value system for them. Critically, it's about sharing, uh, sharing resources, sharing time um, within the community. And it combats uh, loneliness. But it also, it's a model that protects people's privacy as well, and that's quite crucial. OK, um, so co-housing. Um, I think when, when we, we're at the moment, we're trying to uh, understand the scale of demand for co-housing, because uh, when people start to describe how they would like to live, as a blank canvas, what their ideal neighbourhood would look like, so often they pretty much describe a kind of a co-housing scenario. But of course, you know, if you ask people, do you have, what do you think about co-housing, hardly anybody's heard of it. Even though it's massively growing, um, it, they wouldn't necessarily know the, the core components. So it's set, so these are some of the core characteristics, and these are important, especially, as, uh, as I said, with the popularity of co-housing, get all sorts of different versions. I would say it's set up and it's run by the people who live there. Non-hierarchical kind of decision making and that's kind of critical. Residents are involved in the design process from the outset. That's a bit debatable really um, because that's the first residents that are involved in the design of the process, but uh, design of the community. Um, but um, it's, it is about creating that community and it's about sustaining that community once the project is built. Um, this is not about grand designs. Um, it's not about uh, building your ideal home. It's about building, uh, building the community. Okay, so um, a typical co-housing community, um, eight to 40 households. Uh, Lancaster co-housing is the largest one in the UK at 42. Um, the smallest one is the Hackney co-housing that John uh, referenced, uh, Co Coppers Lane, um, Stoke Newington in London. That's actually, I think, below eight, but who's to argue because it's definitely got all the facilities and all of the core characteristics of um, co-housing. Um, it should be that uh, the homes are smaller in theory because you're benefiting from a range of communal resources, that, particularly your common house. Your common house doesn't have to have any kind of set uh, facilities in there, uh, but you would normally uh, expect to see a, a dining room and a, a kitchen so the community can gather um, and share, share meals together. And then after that, it really does depend on what the community is looking for. So uh, spare bedrooms, uh, workspace, children's space, uh, laundries, tool rooms are some of the common, I guess, features that we see in, in, co in common houses. Oh, that's that's not a that's that's just a, an illustration to sort of uh, there is obviously lots of uh, different uh, design patterns of co-housing. It's just a kind of an illustration to show what it might look like. 
Hey, um, co-housing in the uh, in the UK up until now, I think there's been quite a focus on building new um, uh, or renovating uh, redundant property, public sector property. But that's not necessarily uh, that's not necessarily a prerequisite of co-housing. You could set up co-housing where you live, and we'll come on to that from an example in uh, the states where that has happened. Um, there, is, there is an array of legal models for different, the different co-housing communities that are both established and the ones that are set up. It makes it confusing as, a, as a, somebody who manages the network, we very much love to have the sort of template legal documents for co-housing communities to make it much easier. When we looked at that, um, we found just about every legal model in the communities that were forming and established. Um, but what that does say, actually, is that people are adapting. Um, why would, we want to help people not to have to reinvent the wheel. People are adapting their situation to their needs. Um, it's very particular to those communities, and that makes it quite exciting. Within the co-housing, um, existing co-housing movement, there's all forms of tenure. There's a definite uh, swing at the moment to um, home ownership. Uh, but there's also shared home ownership and rental and, as we know, mutual home ownership at Lilac. There's a case study on the, the back there. <clears throat> at the moment, there are 75 plus groups in development across the UK. Uh, it's probably a swing towards urban areas at the moment. But in all, in all, in all the four countries um, in the UK, and there are actually 19 uh, that are built. You can see all 75 uh, on the Co-Housing Network website, which is just cohousing.org.uk, under groups, and they're all listed there, along with the established communities. Um, and some of the, both the developing and the established communities, have brilliant websites themselves. So you can really start to get a feel for the very different types of communities that are are now forming. Twelve of those are senior co-housing communities. <coughs> well, they're age-specific. They're intentionally set up for over 50s. Um, and two of those, three, two of those are starting on site. Well, Ouch is on site at the moment, Older Women's Co-Housing Group in Barnet, finally. Um, and they're due to move in in uh, March next year. There has been quite a lot of media interest in co-housing uh, in the last couple of years. I think it's mainly among the uh, broadsheets rather than the tabloids at the moment, but it's been very uh, positive and it's driven a lot of interest, both from people grassroots, but also from, importantly, from planners, stakeholders that want to support, and it's becoming far more easy to do that through local authorities and so forth. That's, a, that's an interesting quote which I won't read out. Mm. So, um, some questions that you might want to think about. <laughs> so, how do I feel about sharing major decisions about where I live with my neighbours? Major and minor. Um, so, where do the wheelie bins go? Who has pets? What do we cook in the common house? Where's my threshold for tolerance? Where's my threshold for compromise? Can I cope with disagreements? There is no way of getting around that. There will be huge disagreements within the community, and there are good systems in place, providing they're well, they're well adapted and um, adopted, and, and people continue to invest in their training with, to do that, but also invest in the time to be together and to get to know each other. But there will be disagreements. Now, if you're a person that maybe doesn't, doesn't like that kind of conflict or doesn't like to work through that kind of discussion, Co-housing might not be for you. Thinking about the balance between privacy um, and community, uh, as I say, uh, co-housing offers that private home with that, that access to wider community facilities. But where is your boundary? Um, and how, does it, how much does it extend beyond your front door into those other facilities? Mm. <coughs> Okay, so a case study. I'll probably just focus on um, Lancaster because it's my last presentation and I love it. <coughs> so, uh, I'm going faster. So, Forge Bank is a site on the outskirts of Lancaster, um, uh, the village called Halton. Uh, it's, they benefited from the downturn in the housing market. It was a site that was earmarked planning and uh, very much ready to start on site by a private developer. Uh, the bottom fell out of the market and they sold off the site quite, um, <coughs> not, not very cheaply, but at a, a discounted uh, price. 
The group itself were quite keen as part of their value system to be in the center of Lancaster. So this is a windfall site for them that challenged them from the outset. What it did have though, was really good access link. So it's very easy to cycle all the way from um, Holton into Lancaster and some other bits and bats that I think helped it to swing it for the, for the group in terms of their vision and their, their values. So uh, 41, this is the largest uh, development so far of a co-housing community in the UK and it's been very challenging. It's almost like settling a, a, a new village, if you like. It's quite, it's quite a, a sizable community. There's a mixture of one bed and four bed homes there. It's not, it's not, uh, it's passive house standard. Um, they've learnt an awful lot in building those homes because at that stage it was the largest passive house type development in the, in the UK. So the supply chain for for that, uh, I think they found they found very they found very challenging throughout the development. They have a um, a, I would say they've almost got kind of a prototype co-housing design, really textbook design, um, in that they followed the rules. The common house is right in the middle of the community. A great deal of attention has been given to how people move around the site, how they interact with each other, in what is quite a, a long site that stretches all along uh, the River Loon. So it's not ideal when you start with a blank canvas and usually you draw a pretty circle and your common house is there. Um, but they have, they, have, uh, they have done that really well. And the common house is really quite uh, central. Opposite the common house, you've got uh, children's play spaces, uh, guest bedrooms, a laundry room, and um, they have unusually, right at the end of the community, quite a large building that they have converted into a uh, workspace, managed workspace, that's both for some members of the community, but also for people from outside as well. So that's the, that's the kind of the site. You can see the river, this is the river loon. Um, how do you point? I'm oh, sorry. Um, the common house is in the middle here, uh, with the terrace. Um, uh, so that's the common house. There's some of the community facilities there. Um, we've got we've got a mixture of flats, two and three bedroom homes here, and all the way along here. Um, bike storage, I think, is just about there. And this is this massive. Um, workplace it's just about full now. Um, it's called uh, Green Elephant the company that, that managed that. Quite a challenging site, a lot of topography issues um, that uh, pushed the cost up. The homes were delivered for the same price as the, um, the local housing market. I don't think you really can compare the products really of house down the road on its own and what's been uh, created here. But nonetheless, that's an incredible achievement when we scroll back a bit to um, the learning curve that they were on in terms of building these 42 um, homes. That's inside a one-bedroom um, flat. Oh, all these homes um, have been designed, designed, I don't know, designed for life uh, kind of home. They, they, they looked at uh, making the homes as adaptable as possible so people could be able to stay there for as long as possible. So they're, they're all fully um, accessible with uh, wheelchairs. Um, they've, they've adapted them so that the ground floors can be pretty self-contained units. So they've, they've really given a lot of thought and detail to this. This is the pedestrian uh, street. This is a really important um, cycleway for uh, children um, and scooters. Can be quite dangerous. Um, but here they have like the run of the mill up and down here. This is their place and they have a ball. It's, really, it's a really brilliant place for, for, the, for the kids there. Shame I haven't got a picture with them on there, but um, I'm usually looking out of the way. Um. <coughs> This is the uh, this is the uh, this, this here is the playroom and spare bedrooms and this bit here is the common no I've got that wrong there's the common house and there's the spare and you've got this covered area over the top it's great for people to be able to sort of extending out for the common house the common house is really well used it's about five uh, five meals um, uh, a week in there um, a vegan and vegetarian uh, community and this is inside the common house. If anybody's thinking about co-housing, I really, really recommend um, Grace Kim's book on designing common houses. It is 
It's very, very hard to get it. Do get in touch with the network, but it's one of the only studies on how, on how to build a common house. How, no matter how small you are doing it, it's full of really practical advice, the kind of stuff that maybe if your architect or whomever you're working with haven't thought about essential stuff like noise and sound, kitchens, um, lighting, how to make sure that common house generally becomes an extension of your home and not somebody somewhere that feels, yes, it looks pretty, but it's municipal, it's not functional. You can't have six cooks in the kitchen um, and, and so forth. Um, it's a really good book. Study. This, they don't like me showing this pitch because it's actually on moving day. Um, but uh, the, the, there's a, you can get a feel for people hanging out there. Okay. I've had a lot of fun in the River Loon. Right, so as I said, this is a big presentation. I'm not going to go through it all. I'm just going to skip to the one thing about the development uh, journey, but I did think it would be useful for, for everybody to have. This is Ouch, so that's on site now. This is K1 uh, project. I'll just flick through this and get a feel. This is a project that's been enabled by Cambridge um, City Council. Is anyone coming to talk about this over the week? Okay. Um, it's a, it's, it's a diversion, I think, for, although there has been a group in Cambridge for some time, it's a diversion for the co-housing movement that's been very positively enabled by the local authority. Um, and that has sped up, I suppose, the, the process. But you'll have this to look through. Okay. Sorry, it's huge. But I did think it would be a useful resource for you to have. We'll get there. Yeah. That's the customization process. Okay. We're going to get there. Okay, that's a bit about the co housing network. I've left um, some leaflets on the side there, uh, which has all this information on as well. Um, okay, so this inside the brochure that's on the table there is this route map. Um, no group is ever going to follow this route map, and we wouldn't um, expect that. Um, what we did was we looked at several resources on what had made the difference between um, some communities making it and some communities not making it. And we looked at UK resources, international resources, and then we tried to sort of formulate the critical steps um, of, a, of a journey. Um, I would say just about every community has made its own way. Um, but we did do this with intent and with research. Um, one of the most important things is this. If it, it is, uh, it's, it's working out what the vision and values are. And by that, not just coming with a statement that you put on your website, but as a group and as a, as a, as a forming community, really understanding that and testing that and not being shy when it comes to some of those things, the, the elephants in the room as a group that you think, uh, you're not quite comfortable about. That's one of the biggest things that holds groups back, that, that lack of honesty. Really nice people not really wanting to come to the forefront. But working out what it is, what, um, how you're going to work and what you're aiming for is essential and then pinning that up at every single meeting so you will come back to that um, all the time. Um, and so moving on then to the site criteria, building the membership, um, financial capacity site search, these are just some ideas, and you'll see that somewhere we say, you know, do not pass this point unless you have a business plan. The project is viable, you have proof of equity cash. It's, it's just to try and help. Um, also to say, maybe sometimes you need to take a couple of steps backwards if that's not working um, out. And I think that's my time. Um, but I have left all of this here for you to see afterwards, uh, because there's quite a lot in this presentation. I did think it would be a useful resource. Thank you.